Uh, well, good morning. Uh, this is Bill Borum speaking to you. And uh, at this time in the history of business and of tourism, hospitality, uh, people are coming back to hotels and resort destinations and uh, visiting hotels. And uh, we're something that's a lot of interest uh, to the industry and the industry participants since I'm involved also in tourism. And I'm very delighted to have with me this morning uh, Tom Wolf, who has had a terrific impact over his long career on the hospitality industry and hotels in particular, and the very important service segment of what's provided to guests in luxury hotels. So uh, Tom, good morning to you there on uh, Knob Hill, San Francisco. I atop Knob Hill, broadcasting live from the Fairmont Hotel. Almost, but there we are. Right. Well, you've got such a great voice there that you might have a future in broadcasting. But um, anyway, it's a voice that has served you well in the industry over the many years. And I will say that Tom currently, and we'll get into it in more depth, is currently the chief concierge at the very famous Fairmont Hotel which is in the background there with uh, good greetings. And he is also the director of Heritage. And let's dwell on that for a moment, Tom. Uh, what does that mean uh, as to the heritage of the Fairmont Hotel? Well, uh, the Fairmont is kind of one of the key places in San Francisco history. And uh, I worked there in the 70s. And then I had a hiatus where I went around, literally went around the world and worked in many places, including Japan and Southeast Asia and New York, and finally came back uh, sometime later. Uh, and I, I must say that uh, history was never my sort of strong point, but I became fascinated with the Fairmont history. I think once one reaches an age where one kind of is part of the history, uh, that makes a difference. So I'm totally fascinated with the history of the hotel and I've done a lot of research. Oddly enough, there wasn't really a defining history book about the Fairmont. So I had to do a lot of legwork. I had to go to the library and uh, you know, make, make contacts with uh, historians in San Francisco. And I was able to find out a lot of very interesting things about the hotel. For example, uh, there was actually in the early days, bearing in mind the Fairmont opened in 1907, one year right after the earthquake, which alone is a whole story right there. But the Fairmont actually had a radio station up on top of the roof. And it was one of, uh, that was when radio was first starting. And it was one of only about a handful, maybe half a dozen radio stations around the country. And it was broadcasting literally live from atop the Fairmont, the top knob mm -hmm. hill. So I, I kind of uh, did uh, a lot of uh, things for the hotel about the history. I did a video called the Fairmont History, which I'm quite proud of, uh, that goes right through from the earthquake up to the present time. And the... Uh, the stories are just, uh, I mean, if these walls could talk, if they could whisper, if they, it was, it's just been, been, been amazing the, how much I've learned about it and about San Francisco, because uh, to give you just one little kernel of that, uh, okay, the hotel is about ready to open when the great fire happens, as the people back then said. And when I worked there in the 70s, there were still people who had been through the earthquake uh, and fire of 1906. They were old and they were, uh, but some of them were very articulate. And uh, so I got a chance to speak to them. The, the Fairmont uh, was not, uh, it didn't fall down or burn down like so many places did, but there was fire in it. And there was a huge amount of damage from the fire, from water damage, so it had to be rebuilt from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And as a restoration architect, they hired Stanford White, the preeminent architect of the time. Uh, unfortunately, Stanford White wound up getting uh, a bullet 
uh, put through his head by a jealous husband. Uh, and that's a, an entire story right that's there. An, a story in itself, yes. Yes, and I, I think it actually was made into a film, The Girl on the Red Velvet Swing. Right. Uh, but they found Julia Morgan, uh, the owners at the time, they, they, did, they did not want to uh, abandon the idea of opening the hotel again. So they found Julia Morgan, and Julia Morgan, in, uh, another exceptional person, the first female concierge, not concierge, the first female architect for uh, the state of California, the first graduate of the prestigious Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And uh, within one year to the day, she got the hotel redone inside and uh, there was a wonderful celebration. And the culmination of the celebration was everyone was trooped out onto the roof garden uh, overlooking the city and fireworks were shot oh. off at the Fairmont and over by City Hall and in between the Fairmont and City Hall was pretty much leveled you know from the damage of the earthquake so but they could people could see the city rebuilding itself rising like the phoenix from the ashes literally and they knew then that San Francisco would live again. And that's the defining moment, in my opinion, of the rebirth of this great city. Yes, uh, through that hotel, which I think even before the, the idea was to build a hotel, it was the site of a mansion of James Fair, uh, one of the four big, oh, I forget what they called the four of them, uh, the big four they the were big known four as. yes in, in california history but right. um, anyway uh, your part in in history of the industry of hospitality uh really i think uh, at least in the u.s kicks off when you were hired i think in 1974 now was that by ben swig who was the owner at the time uh actually uh ben was the owner at the time uh i was hired by peter goldman the late peter goldman uh, oh, yes. Uh, almost, uh, it, it was just an, uh, a, a, a terrific, uh, fortunate coincidence that I found myself in the Fairmont because I had been living in the East Coast and I wanted to move to the West Coast. And I went, uh, I sent letters out to different uh, hotels and I had interviews at the St. Francis and at the Clift and a few other places, but nothing really concrete, even though I had quite a lot of experience by then, including having worked in Europe for three years. Uh, on, on a, I, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll just walk into the Fairmont. I have, a, I have a foot in the door because a general manager that I had worked for knew Peter Goldman, who was the general manager of the Fairmont. And it was about 5.30 in the evening. And I went down to his office and his secretary was there. And I said, I don't have an appointment, but I have, I'm a friend, I, I'm a person who is bringing greetings from a friend of Mr. Goldman. And uh, so if he's got just a minute or two to spare, I'd love to say hello. So then I, I, I she, so she made me wait a little bit, fine. And then I went in to Mr. Goldman's office and, uh, I told him, I said, I'm bringing you fondest greetings from Tibor Gayari, who was a Hungarian general manager in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, Tibor, how's Tibor doing these days? I said, oh, Tibor is just fabulous, a wonderful man. I hadn't seen Tibor for two years, but uh, <laughs> I, I was creating a little myth there. And uh, then I said to him, uh, and by the way, I am looking for work and here's my resume. Pretty bold move right there. And, uh, you know, I expected him to receive it and put it in his tray and say, you know, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll call you. Uh, but of course that resume you. included um, uh, working for hotels in London and Paris. That's correct. Yes, yes. In fact, he actually looked at it and he said, oh, I see you. Oh, and you speak French too. Uh -huh, okay. Well, well, I'll tell you what, I have a, an, an opening for an assistant manager um, and I don't have anybody. It's the first time I've never had anybody that I can promote from within. So uh, could you do something like that? I said, sure. Cause I'd done assistant manager work in Washington and you know, it was 
very, very easy for me. Excuse me, but but, let me uh, roll back a little bit here. Yes, and please. that is I'm, your undergraduate work was at Michigan State University, I think, and you have a CHA degree. Yes, so that would that come prepared. later. That would come later. Oh, that, that was later. That I, okay. Yeah, I didn't have that at the time. That was uh, that was when I got uh, when I left the industry as when I left the concierge profession, and I briefly was a resident manager at a five star resort, and I did that at, on the special program that Michigan State has with the American Hotel and Motel Association. What is it called? It's called something else now. They don't like the word motel anymore. So. <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, I came back the following day uh, and interviewed with the front office manager and was hired right away. Uh, I found an apartment that afternoon and uh, the next day I was on a plane to fly back home and I was back at the hotel in less than two weeks uh, and there I was, assistant manager sitting in the lobby of the Fairmont, fabulous. Uh, couple, three months go by and here comes Richard Swig, who's the son of the owner. And oh, he's yeah, the Rick, president. Rick Swig. Yeah, Rick Swig. No, no, Rick Swig oh, would be. Richard. Yes. So the, you have Ben Swig, the patriarch, then Richard Swig, his son, and Rick Swig, uh, Richard Swig's son, uh -huh. the grandson of Ben, okay? Uh, and now, I, I have to back up a little bit here to get the timeline right. I'd worked in London and Paris, and that was where I got the idea of wanting to be a concierge, but the uh, apprenticeship level or, or the apprenticeship, uh, what would you call it, the, the mountain that you would have to climb to get to that was a long, long road, a long, long apprenticeship if you wanted to become a concierge. And uh, most of the concierges had started when they were you know, just in school, uh, as page boys and slowly, 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 they worked their way up. And, you know, maybe after 20, 25 years, they became a, a, a proper concierge. Well, uh, here comes Richard Swig uh, and says to me, you know, Mr. Wolf, I, I know that you worked in Europe and uh, uh, I've been trying to start a concierge program here, but nobody knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And, I felt like, boy, did he get the right number? I said, well, I, I know what you're talking about. And furthermore, I'll be happy to, to do that if that's what you'd like. So that was how I got my big break, if you will. And of course, concierge service at that point did not exist in the USA, just did not exist. Uh, the way that we, we were very good at serving a thousand breakfasts. We could uh, take care of the multitudes, but for that one person who needed individual attention, who needed to have his airline ticket fixed or get his wife's shoe repaired, little things like that, there was no one stop for that. You'd have to go to the airline office and maybe they'd be closed for lunch and uh, you know, then the shoemaker would be in another place. So the guest would have to spend half his day doing uh, nominal errands, which in, in Europe, as I knew, uh, you would just go to the concierge and say, here's my laundry list for today. Could you take care of this for me? A, B, C, D, E. Yes, certainly it shall be done. And uh, so uh, I had to, but since I was the only one, nobody really knew what I was doing, <laughs> except, <laughs> except very sophisticated travelers and Europeans, they knew what it was. However, I'd had such a good relationship with the concierges in London at the Ritz Hotel, in Paris at the Lancaster Hotel, and they'd taken me under their wing, this young, brash American who'd had the nerve to come all the way across the pond and work in a hotel, whereas most of the traffic where people were migrating was the other direction. They were going from Europe to the United States to work. I only met one other American in my whole time overseas who had worked mm -hmm. Who, who was from the States and was working in a hotel in, in uh, London. And so the, um, the educational thing was important. I, I had to put tent cards in the room and invite people to uh, use my service. And I wish I had one of those now. They were very nice. We had them. They were glossy tent cards with the golden keys on there. And uh, 
it said the the Fairmont Concierge has special service, and you know, then you flipped it open and it said, you know, please come and visit our concierge, and uh, if you'd like to make any kind of re re reservations or transportation or any special arrangements, uh, he will be there for you. Uh, now I wish I had an unlisted number, but there we are. <laughs> That's how it goes. But the uh, well, the hotel is certainly uh, a grand edifice. I remember my yes. first visit to San Francisco in 1964. One of the places that I visited um, was the Fairmont Hotel, that uh, beautiful entrance, the automobile yes. entrance, and then the grand lobby, unsurpassed uh, virtually, I think, in the US with its many magnificent columns. And uh, it was quite, a, and I remember in the corner, I know it was still there when you started, uh, there was a wonderful ice cream shop called Blum's in the corner. That's right. And That's I right. met a girlfriend there and we continued a correspondence for years. So that was a good payoff from my acquaintance with the Fairmont. Um, so um, uh, from there you went on and I think probably within the, uh, the Fairmont chain as it was growing, probably encouraged. And I'll ask you if you did, that there be concierges at other Fairmonts. Yes, indeed. Well, one of the things that I was able to do uh, was get into the clay door, the Golden Keys Society, which is this pin here, and actually this pin here too. So uh, this was a prestigious society of a uh, kind of guild of professional concierge around the world, uh, except that in those days, it was mainly just in Europe. Uh, the concierges with whom I had worked were very well connected in that world and they were able to introduce me to Jean Gillet who was the president of the Clay Door and I became the first Clay Door member in the United States. And uh, to your point, yes, other hotels now were discovering that this is a service we've got to have too. This isn't just some fancy amenity like a, you know, a Michelin star restaurant or something. This is a necessity for the sophisticated traveler. So uh, uh, little by little, uh, other hotels started having concierge. The Clift Hotel, I remember, was one of the early adopters of it. Uh, the Stanford Court right across the street from us. And uh, here and there, uh, they were, they, they were deciding that a concierge department was a good thing. Uh, the this allowed me to have meetings uh, of the local concierge and to, because my dream was to establish an American chapter of the clay door in San Francisco, starting in San Francisco. And uh, I remember Holly Steele, who was at the Hyatt Hotel at Union Square, she was uh, the first female member. Uh, and the, we had a meeting and uh, one of the concierge was in the group and we're only about five or six at this point. Uh, he came in and he said, uh, hey, did you know that the Hyatt on Union Square has a concierge? I said, no, no, that's, that's, that's great news. Uh, he said, but wait a minute, I gotta tell you something. I said, well, what is it? And he said, uh, it's a woman. And I said, okay, it's a woman, but uh, <laughs> is it a concierge? That's the question. You know, is it somebody who they put a sign up that says concierge and just said, okay, you'll be the concierge, or is it an actual person who's doing concierge work? Please make a field trip because that's your patch. That, that uh, person I think was working at the St. Francis or someplace near Union Square. And uh, he said, okay, I'll do a field trip and I'll, I'll report next month. And I said, absolutely legitimate. She's doing all the concierge service like we are doing. I said, well, that's terrific. And I sent her a letter. I still have it uh, where I invited her to come to a, the following meeting. And that is how she became uh, the first female concierge. And uh, she was, uh, she, she, she went on to great success and, uh, eventually got her own company, and she's a motivational speaker, Holly Steele, S-T-I-E-L. 
Right. And, yeah. Uh, very... Well, I think uh, Holly is someone that my wife, uh, who was a concierge for 21 years, uh, knew Holly Steele, went to and went to certain of her sessions that her uh, resort hotel uh, recommended. So I've known that name, and uh, uh, I actually first became acquainted with you in a professional sense with uh, the Northern California Concierge Association, which I That's think right. you also founded. That's right. So, um, That's exactly right. and it's a tremendous, uh, dedicated group of people at the best hotels uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I find, though, myself occasionally that there are even Americans to this day, uh, and and uh, you know, upscale, luxury type people that are not too acquainted with the uh, availability of a concierge at the hotel they're going to. It don't know what a hotel does. A concierge does. So that's a little bit of a surprise. I think that uh, one of the uh, uh, films that uh, really made it clear uh, about the role of a concierge was the Grand Budapest Hotel. Oh, yes. yes indeed. Uh, released, I think, in uh, 2014. And that was that must have brought a lot of uh, laughs uh, to, to you. Oh, yes, yes, we have a lot of fun with that. And the uh, uh, we kind of uh, venerate that film that that was really, really uh, well done. And it was uh, actually quite accurate. I mean, that we do have a network. Uh, and we do talk to each other like like that uh, all the time. So it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's very good. I think that Ralph, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it Fines? Fiennes? Ralph Fines, I think. Ralph Fines. He did an incredibly good job on that right. character. And, I think uh, it was what Monsieur Gustave was. Yes, that's been. right, Monsieur Gustave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, what and I, was, I mean, I was familiar with the work of concierge. This is again through my wife, but um, uh, as you say, the network prevailed. Their uh, cables to each other, telephone calls, timely. Uh, but it was the resilience and the resourcefulness of the concierges that came through. Yes, I'll, I'll tell you a little story uh, that happened this morning. I got a call from Moscow, and uh, it's a very lovely lady there who is a, who is a concierge and one of the primary movers and shakers of the Russian uh, clay door. She has a client that uh, he, he was raised in San Francisco, although he's Russian, uh, and I think he's a singer. And he's very fond of a particular kind of cake. So she wants, and that's a cake that's unique to San Francisco. I, I, you know, I didn't get what kind of cake it was because it was just a message. And the message was basically, uh, uh, you know, he, he want, his wife wants to give him this cake uh, as a birthday present. And I thought, well, you know, uh, if I think something like a Sacripantina cake uh, from the Stella Pastry on Columbus Avenue, that's a, a unique to San Francisco kind of cake although the original recipe comes from Naples, but, uh, and I thought, I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, rather than trying to fly one over to, to them there where it's not gonna, it's gonna melt or it's not gonna be any good or it'll arrive and it'll be in bits and pieces. Uh, let's make the cake for him over there using the ingredients. <laughs> so my, my, uh, my assignment now I'm gonna have to somehow secure this secret recipe for this as yet unknown cake and uh, figure out the ingredients because if the ingredients are such that, you know, that they're readily available, I know Moscow might not have uh, a Dean and DeLuca or, <laughs> or maybe they do now, who knows, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, we can get the ingredients here easily enough and uh, ship the ingredients over there and she can have one of her chef friends whip up this cake, literally. And there you have it, M mission accomplished. That is a great story and a perfect example of the resourcefulness of a concierge. Sure. You're still doing it every day, Tom. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Loving every minute of it. I'm, I'm sure you do. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting as you travel around, as anyone travels around the world, you're in a luxury hotel, you look around, you check in. And the next thing, at least what I do, looking over my shoulder is to where's the concierge desk? And right. uh, oftentimes they'll be displaying the keys as well. Yes. Yes, and uh, I, I think in the film, just going back to that momentarily, mm -hmm. they did have keys shown, but I don't think it was the clay door keys. I mean, I don't know whether they could have, I don't know if you know the clay that. door keys, uh, uh, the clay door keys have a little band underneath that says Le Clay Door on it. And th th that is copyrighted. Uh, the symbol of the crossed keys is actually not copyrighted. And you know, uh, I remember uh, there was a locksmith that came to do, uh, I don't know, the safes at the Fairmont or something. And he had uh, a patch with the crossed keys because he's a locksmith. And I thought, he said, you've, you've got the same symbol I've got. Uh, but uh, in the Grand Budapest, they had keys where the, uh, on this one, the, I, I forget what you call this, the tines of the keys, the things that activate the lock mechanism, uh, they're facing this way, facing outward. On those keys, they were facing inward. So, uh, but uh, the, it was, it was we, we got the idea. I mean, that was it, you know. Uh, so that was, uh, that was kind of interesting. To, uh, that is, to that's right, yeah. So you also uh, traveled to and worked in Japan and learned the language there. So how long were you in Japan? And I think you helped to start the uh, concierge movement in Japan. Well, this is true. It was deja vu all over again. <laughs> the, uh, I went to Japan on a vacation. I was looking to kind of turn a page in my uh, book of life, as it were. And I went to Japan and I saw these wonderful hotels with great service. And then I said, what's missing here though? Oh, I know what's missing. There's no concierge service. There wasn't any hotel that had a concierge then. And this is uh, circa 1982, um, 83, okay? Uh, and I, th and, and I, and I, I stayed in Japan for two weeks. I went to Kyoto, I went here and there, and I discovered that I just fell in love with the country. I just loved the whole culture. I loved the music. I loved the, the traditions. There was so much to like about Japan. Uh, I said, you know, this is this this would be a really good thing if I could come over here, and so I made my pitch uh, to about five hotels, including the Imperial Hotel. And I remember going to the Imperial Hotel, uh, which the original Imperial Hotel uh, had been done by Frank Lloyd Wright, and that that is not there anymore, that it's, they, they modernized it. But the physical structure of the Imperial has been moved to an architectural museum near Nagoya, which I did visit, so that's interesting. But the, uh, the hotels uh, all sang the same song. Gee, it's really interesting, we, we, we like you, we think you're really a good person, but we will not be able to get a visa for you. And here again, the last hotel I went to, uh, the new Otani, I met a fellow named Mr. Koda, who was the number one fellow with Nuotani and one of the greatest hotel men I've ever encountered. He's, 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 he, he's a Cornelian as well. Uh, he said to me, the most difficult thing is going to be getting you a visa. And I, I, I was not, um, I was not glib enough to say, well, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> and I just said, I just very wisely did a mm -hmm, you know, good Japanese style. And uh, he said, but let me see what, what, what I can do. Well, and that, that, was, that was great. That was huge. And um, so I, I went back home and I didn't hear from him for about three months. And I thought, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be the pushy American. Hey, how about that uh, conversation we had? But I finally sent him a very tactful letter. I think it was around Christmas or something. So I, I, I sent a Christmas card with a little note inside. By the way, I just wonder if you uh, have had any chance to 
uh, follow up on the chat we had. Nice and diplomatic. And uh, I got a reply back saying, uh, yes, we are working on it. Uh, please be patient. And I said, sure, sure. And it, about a year later, I'm not kidding, about a year later, uh, well, actually about, about six months later, I got a call from the Japanese consulate in San Francisco saying that I should present myself there with my passport. And I thought, my gosh, this is it. This is it. They're going to give me the visa. So I put on my best suit. I, I got all looking great. I went over there and I, I, and I practiced on, you know, Haji me mashte urufu des, you know, this, I'm Mr. Wolf and here's my passport, how to even hand it to them. And uh, the person behind, and it was like a glass thing, the person took it and said, okay, uh, 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 just wait a minute, please. <laughs> and uh, so I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And uh, then he came back out and he goes, Wolf san. I thought, wow, he's calling me my, my Japanese name already. This is great. This is it. And he, and he not only handed me back the passport, but he, he opened it and showed me the page. And sure enough, there was a stamp on there. And I looked at it and I said, wow, this is, this is magic. And I said, that, that's my visa, I guess, huh? And he said, oh, no, no, Wolf son. no, that's not your visa. That just says you were here today. Oh. And I said, oh, okay, well, thank you very much indeed for that, okay? Imagine the elation suddenly turning into disappointment, like in a, in a split second, like a balloon being popped. Uh, you know, if they had a musical tag, it would be the wah, 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 be one of those. Okay, I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth shut. I didn't, I didn't fire off a note to the hotel or anything. I just waited. And about a couple of months after that, a gigantic envelope came in the mail. And I mean like, like, like that thick. And it was all in Japanese. Form after form after form after form after form, all in Japanese. I called up a Japanese friend of mine. She came over and she went through every piece of it one by one. And uh, it was uh, reference letters and things like that and all of this stuff and stuff that I had to fill out. Anyway, I did it all, sent it right back to them. And, uh, and, and again, months went by. And then finally, I got another call from the consulate would you come to the uh, consulate, please, and bring your passport? And I, I felt like saying, yeah, yeah, I know that old gag. Sure, sure, I will. But I didn't, like, go there in blue jeans and a T-shirt. No, I got all dressed up again. I went, I did my repeat performance. And uh, this time, this was it. They, they came back. It took them longer than the first time, but they came <clears> back, <throat> and they said, this is your visa for working in Japan. And I said, holy smokes. So now, armed with a visa, I was able to now, you know, re tell the hotel, hey, I'm ready to come to work. When do you want me? And so we agreed on a date, which was fairly soon. I packed my meager belongings and shipped them over. I, I, about the only thing I had of value was the Kennedy rocking chair, which I don't, long, don't have anymore. But it was because I worked for Robert Kennedy way back, way back when. And I had a, a rocking chair that was a, made by the guy who made... President Kennedy's rocker. Well, uh, when I got off the plane in Tokyo, uh, they have the sign that says, uh, you know, tourists this way, uh, uh, Japanese and permanent residents this way. And I, I hesitated a minute. And I said, wait a minute. I, 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 this is it. I, I live in Japan now. I, I can take <laughs> it. I can go in that line. And I did, and I, of course, I expected them to say, you know, you're in the wrong line, Mac, or something right. like, no, no, right through. Yes, welcome. And uh, th that was a great moment for me. So that I'm sorry to, that was kind of a link. Well, that's uh, a wonderful story. Now, how long did you work in Japan? Uh, and I, when I worked in Japan, it was uh, for uh, almost five years. Uh -huh. And uh, it was, it was marvelous because uh, I was already, you know, Clay Dora member, so I could wear my keys. And I was the only concierge in Japan at that point in time. They didn't have it. And so I, and I had a team of 15 
young ladies who were called social directors. And what I did is I used them to become, to, to, to build the first concierge department. And so uh, we'd, we'd meet once a week and I would uh, teach them things about being concierge and what to do. And that was a wonderful time because it was a kind of a cultural thing. I was the first foreigner too, to be a manager and to be out in front mm -hmm. uh, of the public. In fact, excuse me for going off camera here for a second. I just came across uh, at one of the meetings that we had uh, at the New Otani, I came across this place card, which has Urufu, that's how they called me, Ur, Urufu. And then this kanji is Kacho, which means section chief. So I was also the only foreigner to have that title ever. So uh, it, it was a very, very interesting kind of cultural immersion. And yes, I had a few people who didn't like the fact that there was an American or that I, there was a gaijin. You know, gaijin is this wonderful word which is incorrectly translated as foreigner, but it really means anybody who isn't Japanese. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, uh, I remember once going to a sushi bar in New York, this was years later when I returned to the States, and chatting with the sushi chef, I said, uh, you get a lot of gaijin customers here? And he said, uh, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, uh, no, 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 I don't. I said, so you mean all these guys over here are Americans with American passports? You know, because this place was filled with Japanese. And right. he thought that was really funny. But a gaijin is simply some, somebody who's not Japanese. Uh, but uh, that was overcome by the fact that I was proving very useful for the hotel. And I had uh, three major things that happened during my tenure. Uh, there was the, uh, the Tokyo summit of the, whatever the number of nations, uh, you know, it was like- uh, Was it ASEAN um, by any chance or? No, 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 it was the, um, it was like Germany, France, and we, and we had, and the hotel, the hotel, which had 2,000 rooms, was completely enclosed. It had been circled by fencing, and you could not get in or out unless you were part of the delegations that were staying there because they had, uh, they had the Germans, they had the British. Uh, we didn't have the Americans, but the Americans were around a lot because uh, President Reagan at the time uh, would come to meetings there. And uh, and I, uh, so I was in good contact with the Secret Service. In fact, this is one of the flags I got there somewhere. There it is, the American flag with the little star on it. But the, uh, uh, when he came to the uh, New Otani the first time, I asked my boss, I said, Mr. Takeuchi, did you want me to greet uh, the president since I'm American? And he said, no, 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 it's okay, uh, Tom, you just stay inside here, okay? I said, fine, fine. And so they greeted him, gave him the official greeting, and then he came through the door and I was standing there and he, and he, and he was really surprised to see a non-Japanese person there inside. And I looked at him in the eye and I said, Mr. President, welcome to the new Otani. And he, and he gave me that kind of you know, glassy eyed look and he said, he didn't, no, he didn't say, there you go again. But <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderful but he, story. Yeah, well, was I know that your, your wife, uh, Takiko, is a Jap of Japanese background. Did you meet her while you were in Japan or through other Japanese connections here? This was uh, amazing what happened with her because as a gaijin, uh, I, I was a novelty and I, I was single. And uh, I, I, I didn't really have to even try to meet girls because they would come up to me just the fact that I was a gaijin and uh, so I, I, I had no problem with finding you know willing girls who want to go out on a date and uh, I in fact I got to the point where I would hang out at this piano bar called uh, the Lamplight Club it's long gone now unfortunately and the owner who played the piano and um, also ran the restaurant and also smoked and drank while all this was going on 
and would the phone would ring and he'd answer the phone and then he'd look up at me. And if I was having a chat up with a nice young lady, uh, I'd nod my head, no, no, I'm not here. <laughs> or uh, conversely, if I, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, that was before cell phones. And uh, so I'd come to the phone and say, yeah, come on over. I'm at the Lamplight Club, you know, you know so that was, it was very good. But getting back to the important thing, uh, we had a cocktail party for a lot of the local uh, companies and it was well attended uh, by, you know, upper echelon people from the different firms. Uh, there was a company called Darban, spelt like Durban, South Africa, D apostrophe U-R-B-A-N. And Darban was a uh, very high-end men's fashion company. Uh, they marketed Armani stuff, Karl Lagerfeld stuff, and many other things. And uh, I met this wonderful, beautiful girl at the party, and, and I gave her my beard. And she was so striking looking because she was, um, first of all, she was in a man's, man's world, a, a Japanese company, in a very high level as a woman that was still very unusual back then. Uh, and she had very short hair and uh, almost boyish looking, but also absolutely gorgeous. And uh, I, she didn't speak really any English at all. And I wanted to call her and I called her office. And every time I'd called, it'd say she's not here. Uh, and I had even one of the social directors to call in, in like the perfect, most polite Japanese, uh, do that. And, uh, sorry, Wolf son, she's not there, but I left a message for her to call and I left, you know, hundreds of messages for her. She never called me back. And finally, after about a month, uh, I rang up the company and by golly, she answered the phone. The, the secretary must have been out, uh, you know, in doing something anyway. Uh, and I asked her right then and there if she would like to go out to dinner. And there was this lengthy pause. And then finally, uh, she said, uh, hi. Yes. I said, well, wow, that's great. So I took her to this very, very exclusive uh, piano bar and restaurant called uh, La Scala, uh, also long gone. And uh, that was our first date. And when she went to the ladies room, the owner of the restaurant, who was a very elegant lady, Mrs. Okamoto, later married a big uh, head guy of Johnson and Johnson. Anyway, she, uh, uh, she uh, said to me, Thompson, this girl is very special because uh, she'd been talking to her. She said, this, this girl is very, very special. I think this is the one for you. So, Armed with dictionaries, uh, we, we would go out on dates and slowly my Japanese rose and slowly she learned English and uh, we were inseparable from that first day forward. Yeah. All those other girls air out the window. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> lady. You know? And uh, we, after about uh, two years, we were married at the Meiji Shrine which was wonderful. That was in a traditional Japanese wedding ceremony where I had to wear a kimono. And of course she wore the bridal kimono and uh, that, that was marvelous. And we had our wedding reception at La Scala, which is where we had our first date. And we've lived heavily, happily ever after. Uh, that is 30, 34 uh, years uh, next, uh, the end of this month. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, I didn't realize you had been married that long and yes. you have been living for a number of years on Knob Hill in a wonderful yes. lifestyle that is comparable to the luxury of the nearby Fairmont Hotel. And uh, I was very happy to see the hotel is reopened and you yes. are ready to continue serving, which you have been doing. I was struck by a well, Facebook photo and caption uh, shortly ago where you said you were ready to serve and you went on to note uh, your attire uh, on that posting, which was a jacket by Versace, a scarf by Hermé, <laughs> beret from Gallery Lafayette, uh, but jeans by Levi Strauss. 
and uh, <laughs> shoes by Chuck Taylor and uh, high tops, well, by uh, Converse uh, and a mask by your wife. Techie. That's right. So, <laughs> right. Well, I was going to prompt also, I think you were pictured with your dog. Now, I, I hope your dog has a pedigree. Uh, actually, let me see here. Let me just be down here just a minute. Ah, here we are. We're talking ah. about you, Chanel. There she is. Uh, Chanel is, is a rescue dog, and I got her uh, about uh, 11 years ago when I was very, very sick. I could barely walk at that time. And she, with their Yoda ears <laughs> and her love and affection and companionship, uh, brought me right back uh, to life, and I recovered. So this wow. is uh, the beauty of it. The, the, the power that pets have. So of That's course, I have, sure. to give my, I have to give my wife credit as well and a few other people uh, as well, but there we are. This is it. Still, still nice? going strong. Well, let's get, exactly. get back to the uh, concierge briefly and then to the industry. Um, sure. So as to a concierge, um, should uh, concierges, concierges be tipped or is that an affront to their religion? Uh, well, I'll quote Jean Gillet, the late Jean Gillet, my, my mentor. Uh, he was being interviewed on TV. He had a wonderful French accent, too. Uh, and he was being, he, he, he was asked that's, that very question. And he said, well, you know how it is. Uh, a handshake is a good tip, and so is a $100 bill. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really, uh, it's not a percentage of uh, the check like you would do with a waiter or, you know, similar uh, kind of uh, like a taxi. Uh, it's really up to you. And I've had guests who uh, I've done tons of things for who have not even said thank you. That's not good. I mean, <laughs> and then I've had guests who I've done hardly anything for. And I, I had one lady one time, she wanted to borrow an umbrella. We had loaner umbrellas there. And I handed her an umbrella and she gave me a bill and I looked at it, uh, which I don't do that in front of people, you know, but I look at it before I put it in my pocket and it was a hundred dollar bill. And I went right back to her and I said, excuse me, ma'am, uh, you gave me a hundred dollar bill here. She said, I know that I did. I said, I said, well, thank you very, very much. That's all I did was hand out an umbrella. So there's no set rule for it, but it's whatever you feel. If you feel they did something good for you or they saved your life at the last minute because of, they got you collar stays like I lent to Prince Charles and he never gave them back. And they were nice <laughs> ones. They were sterling silver, but uh, well, I suppose I could say by royal appointment, supplier of collar stays to his royal <laughs> highness, right? Well, that's but, a great uh, tale. That's wonderful. What an anecdote that sure. is. Well, um, I know I talked to a concierge very recently, um, a former concierge, and she said something which I've understood about the profession, that is apart from being asked to do things, which you've given wonderful examples, there's also, she said, and I've heard other concierges say this, they wake up every day wondering how they can wow their guests and how they can embellish their service. Yes, this is true. And uh, I, I have to hand it to many of my colleagues who have incredible creativity. And uh, it's like this cake thing, you know, uh, that, that's on my mind, in front of my mind right now. What can we do to make that happen? And how can we make it happen in a, in a good way and so on and so forth? I mean, I could, you know, I, I was picturing myself uh, sitting on an Aerofloat uh, plane with the cake on my lap you know, downing shots of vodka. Uh, and then I thought, mm, I don't think so, no. Aeroflot does not have a direct flight from here to Moscow, so sorry. <laughs> but uh, yes, you, you want to always, uh, always have something in your back pocket that you can do uh, for somebody that'll, that will knock their socks off. And uh, it could be as simple as remembering a child's birthday. I mean, children are wonderful. They're, they're, they're I would say sometimes the best clients for a concierge because mm. you, you're, you're coming to them and you're giving them something that they, that 
has never happened to them before, that experience, which is where I got into the hotel business. When I grew up, I grew up in New York City and my parents used to take us out to dinner a lot. And we'd go into these beautiful hotels and you'd see the doorman with the uniform with all the buttons. And I was, I, I can remember looking up and being awestruck uh, at, at everything. And eventually as I grew older, uh, when I was 16, we lived in Mexico for a summer. And uh, I remember going to the hotel there and just feeling so welcomed and thinking that I wouldn't mind being on the giving side of that because it feels so good to the person you're giving it to. Right. Uh, and it does feel good for the giver too. For sure. It really does. Well, I, speaking of New York, I recall, I think that you had worked at the Plaza Hotel and did some things for Ivanka Trump. Uh, not Ivanka, Ivana. Ivana. All right. How could I be confused? Ivana. Trump. <laughs> well, uh, but you worked at the was, plaza. Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, and there's a really good story on how that job uh, developed. Uh, I was in Tokyo, and I guess I was in my fifth year there. And all of a sudden, as Japanese companies do, they had a rotation. Now, the rotation means uh, you, you, uh, you as a manager uh, get summoned and, it's, okay, listen, uh, Mr. Wolf, as of next week or as of next month, we're going to be moving you to the Nagoya property where you'll be in charge of blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the person in Nagoya gets moved to some other place. It's like a big giant game of checkers. Okay. Uh, my really, really good friend, uh, Mr. Ando, who I knew from uh, some years before I came to work at the New Otani, uh, and who, uh, by coincidence, wound up working side by side with me, uh, he got rotated. He was getting rotated out. And our boss, Mr. Takeuchi, was getting rotated out. The new boss was a very nice man, but I knew things were not going to be the same. And uh, I thought, well, maybe, you know, I've been here almost five years. Maybe it's time to think about something interesting. Uh, a couple of months, maybe three or four months prior to, to that happening, Ivana Trump had been on CNN uh, talking about the acquisition of the Plaza Hotel. Trump's had bought the Plaza. Uh, so this is circa 1985. Um, no, I'm sorry, 1989. And uh, you know Ivana, she, she, was, she, she was just really, really uh, talking, so excited and so uh, kind of gushing, if you will. She said, uh, she, the, 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 and the announcer was playing to her. He said, and, uh, I understand you're going to be bringing the Grand Tom back to life. And she, and she said, oh, yes, darling. She kind of sounds a little bit like uh, Zsa, Zsa Gabor sometimes. He says, yes, darling, we are going to have the best of everything. We are going to have the best concierge in the world, the best kitchen, the best restaurant, blah, 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 blah. And I noted at that moment that the top of her shopping list was the best concierge in the world. Now, here it is three or four months later, and I'm starting to think, hmm, wonder if this would work or not. And I thought, you know, I'm going to write a letter to Ivana, and I'm not going to tell my wife. And it probably won't even get to Ivana's desk, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I, I wrote a letter to her. I said, congratulations on the acquisition of the plaza, that wonderful palace, uh, Central Park, and blah, blah, blah. And I heard you say that you're going to have the greatest concierge in the world working there. Mrs. Trump, I am that man. <laughs> and, and then I said, I've enclosed my resume, blah, blah, blah. Well, I thought, you know, if that even gets out of the mailroom, I'll be lucky. Uh, but three days later, uh, uh, I was actually in the tub and my wife came with, the, we had cordless phones then, no cell phones, but cordless phones. She said, uh, there's a phone call for you from the Plaza Hotel in New York. <laughs> I said, really? I picked up. And the girl uh, said, uh, Oh, yes, yeah, so this is Mrs. Trump's office calling. She'd like to know how quickly you can get to New York for an interview. And uh, 
I said, well, I'll have to check my calendar. And then I sort of splashed <laughs> the water a little bit. That's all I could do. I said, uh, I could perhaps make it uh, by next weekend. So they flew me over for the interview, uh, kept me for two days. And it, was, it, was, it wasn't like, uh, okay, we'll let you know. It was like, it was a, a fait accompli. I was hired. It was, it, was this, it was really interesting because usually, you know, you go for an interview and then they say, okay, we'll let you know we have other candidates interested or whatever, whatever. No, no, no. It was kind of given that I would, it was like, how quickly can you start? And uh, so Ivana very kindly moved, uh, moved us lock, stock and barrel from Tokyo to New York. And we had a wonderful time there. My wife, being a Tokyoite, loved New York. She adapted to the place really quick. I couldn't remember, I hadn't been in New York for 15 years. Uh, and I was telling people you could take the, the IRT or the BMT. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you're in New York, you remember that, right? You had the, the, the IND was the other one, that was the A train. Uh, you, you, I, I, and and they, they started nudging me saying, Tom, Tom, there's no more IRT and IND, no. And <laughs> so I had to relearn New York like overnight and uh, learn all of the new restaurants and everything. But it was nice. And meanwhile, uh, oh, in the room that we had overlooked Grand Army Plaza and my wife looked out the window and she saw the fountain and then she said, what's that over there? And I said, oh, that's the, the, the Paris cinema. It's just a little art cinema. And she said, no, 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 next to it. Oh, I said, oh, darling, that's Bergdorf Goodman. She said, and what is that? I said, it's a very nice store. That, <laughs> that, be, that began a lifelong love affair between my wife and Bergdorf's. Right. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's another fabulous story with so much color, Tom. Oh, yes. Just, uh, fantastic. Um, well, winding up here, I wonder without becoming too general, if you might have, uh, what would you identify as the key personal qualities or attributes if someone wants to be a concierge to aspire to that position? What, what should they have in their personality or character other than what we can impute from what you have already described about yourself? Well, you know, uh... What makes a great concierge? That would be a, a good question there. But uh, and I, I'll tell you what doesn't make a good concierge. <laughs> I had one fellow that I interviewed once, many years ago, and he came in. First of all, he was late for his interview by fifteen minutes. That's inexcusable, right there. Uh, secondly, he said that uh, he spoke uh, seven languages. And, um, and that people were just raving about his service. And I thought, you know, uh, why didn't I ask this fellow to go outside and check his ego because uh, he was so full of himself. And I, I, that is what you don't wanna have. Somebody who's got a big head who thinks they're really great. Seven languages, I actually told him, I said, I think you might have a good chance at Berlitz. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I have always said, it's as basic as this. Uh, there's two things. Your heart has to be huge. You have to have the givingness of a nurse or, or a teacher. When I see teachers who come to the uh, Fairmont, I always shake their hand. I said, thank you very much for your service because they're giving. I mean, yikes. People don't go into teaching for the money. That's for sure. And uh, you know, it breaks my heart when I see that some teachers are like spending their own money to buy school books or, or notebooks or things like that. That That's no good. Uh, so you've got to have that givingness or like a nurse. You've got to be willing to give, give, give. And when you think you can't give any more, you got to reach down and give some more. That's got to be in your DNA. And the other thing is, although your heart has to be huge, your head has to remain the same size always. Mm. Don't let it go to your head. Just because you got a call from the mayor asking if he could park his car out front, that doesn't mean that you're, you know, the greatest thing that ever came along. No, no. If, if you weren't there, somebody else would be asked that question. So don't ever let it go to your head and have humility so that 
because the knowledge you can you can gain. I learned the city of Tokyo. It took me two years, I have to say, but I learned it so that I know it very very well. I I, I could say I know it like a native, but but I was a native, wasn't I? <laughs> well, what you said um, about uh, keeping things in proportion and not letting it go to your head. I remember a comment made to me when I first uh, joined the uh, tourism industry as a chauffeur, as a matter of fact, the owner said to me, you know, when you're with people taking them around, he said, remember, it's all about them. Right. And their visit. Absolutely true. You, you know, um, that that's, that's the whole point. My wife nudges me, uh, often when we're out together with people because she's just you know she doesn't want me to keep talking about myself well you know sometimes they'll say something and it just triggers a story and i've got all these stories about funny things that happened to me over the years and uh and and uh but she's right what 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 about that person what did they do what, what's their path through life look like so i i couldn't agree with you more it's all about the client and, and they're, the, they're, the, they're the reason you're there. Very much so. Well, Tom, this has been absolutely delightful. I was so curious about more of the tales of your career, but the anecdotes have been so engaging. And I'm so very glad that we've done this, that we can get this out to many more people so they can know you better. And you're, you've got a tremendous renown um, across the US and really across the world. So uh, thank you very much. I'll let you get back to pleasing your guests. <laughs> well, I'll leave you with one thought. I had a very dear friend who was the head concierge at the Waldorf Towers named Herb Tepper. He's passed away, unfortunately, but Herb, his motto was very simple. He had a very good, almost a radio announcer's voice and he'd say, Tom, it's nice to be nice. I think that <laughs> says it all. It certainly does. Well, again, have a great day and great to have you. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate it.